Hi everyone, my name is James, James Little. I've just turned 16, so now consider myself as grown up. I am an only child, with a mother who is perhaps too maternal and overprotective at times and seems sometimes to wish that I hadn't grown up, and a father who works hard but whose work often takes him abroad. In short, I am a very happy child from a very happy home with parents who both love me. The only downside is that I am very short for my age, and the other kids at school are really cruel and constantly tease me by calling me Little James rather than James Little, which really gets me annoyed. Even the teachers seem to join in, one especially, who when he does the register each morning calls almost everyone else's name as say, Michael King, but when he gets to me insists on putting my surname first, so says Little, James. Although he does pause slightly between them, it's hardly noticeable and he also pronounces the D's more like T's so it sounds more like little. James, he always smiles to himself, and sure he thinks it's a big joke. He does occasionally call another person's name the wrong way round like mine, but I'm sure it's just so I can't complain he's getting at me. It was a Tuesday evening in late June when mother told me that she had to take her mother for a hospital appointment the following afternoon so would not be home before 7 o'clock p.m. at the earliest. She gave me some money telling me that I was now old enough to come home by myself, get some fish and chips on the way, and be trusted to wait for her return without needing a babysitter. This was first real opportunity of being left to do whatever I wanted to do, and when I went to bed that night I fell asleep planning my afternoon and evening. I awoke next morning, and spent the day wishing school would hurry up and end. I had planned to buy my food and take them to the park, eat them there and wander home either in front of the TV choosing whatever channel I wanted to watch, or spending more time than I was usually allowed to on the computer or PlayStation, but I now decided not to be too specific, but to do whatever I felt like doing at the time, after all, I now had that freedom of choice. At last the bell went, and at 3.45 I rushed out to put my plans into action. The weather was lovely and sunny, but a big black cloud suddenly appeared from nowhere after lunch, and we had one of those deluges of torrential rain you often get in summer, but which only lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. I feared my plans were ruined but the rain stopped, the clouds disappeared as quickly as they had come, and the sun soon came out again. I stopped at the chip shop, bought a portion of sausage and chips, opened to take away, covered them in salt and tomato sauce, and scurried off to the park to eat them before they went cold. The benches were all occupied, mainly by mothers with very young children, so I sat on one of the swings, mindlessly swinging slightly forward and back as my thoughts were elsewhere. Finishing my meal, I scrunched up the empty paper into a ball. I knew I couldn't reach the rubbish bin from a seated position but, always looking for a challenge, I wondered whether if I used the momentum from a forward swing I could launch it into the bin basketball style. It would have to be a great shot, but I had to try. I swung forward and backwards, gained as much height and speed as I could, and released the ball of paper at the critical moment, damn. I missed but such was the intensity of my concentration that I was totally oblivious to what was around me. I had not noticed the three girls, two years younger than me at my school, laughing and giggling that it could only be little James who would be playing on the kiddie's swings like the little boy his name suggested. As the swing slowed down to a stop one of them grabbed the chains, another pushed me, and I was sent headfirst into the water and mud still left over from the earlier downpour that had not dried up in the holes caused by the kids dragging their feet as they swung to and fro and to stop the swing. Not content with ruining half my school uniform from the fall, each time I tried to get up they knocked me back down with their feet, and as I slithered and slid from one mud patch to the next I was pretty much caked in mud from my hair to my shoes. I was annoyed that the girls were so mean, frustrated that I couldn't get up, and in a panic about what my mother would say if she saw the state my uniform was in. With a sense of relief and embarrassment, I was rescued by Melanie and Sarah, two girls a few years older than me who had left school the previous year, and who lived near to us and whom I have to confess I'd always had a bit of a crush on. They were now both young women, too old for me, and out of my league, 
but it didn't stop me admiring them from a distance whenever I saw either of them. They soon told my three assailants where to go, but they couldn't help but laugh when they saw me standing before them covered in mud and soaked from head to toe. Their laughter, however, quickly turned to pity, and they asked me if I needed any help. I thanked them for chasing the others away, and explained that I would go home and get myself cleaned up before mother returned home, as fortunately she would be some time as she was visiting her mother. Good luck then they said, it's a good job you know how to use a washing machine, and began walking away. I suddenly realized I had no idea how to use one, but convinced myself that I could just wash everything in the sink and all would be fine. I put my hand in my pocket to get out my door key, and realized that in my haste to leave that morning I had forgotten to pick it up off my desk. I had no way of getting back into the house. Reluctantly, and in desperation, I caught up with Melanie and Sarah and explained my predicament. To my relief they were very understanding and after a quick smile to each other Sarah said, in a rather patronizing and condescending way I've our house to myself until later this evening, why don't we go and sort you out? She turned to Melanie and said to her I'm sure we can find something suitable for young James whilst his clothes are being washed, oh yes, replied Melanie, I think this is going to be such fun. I wasn't really tuned into their ulterior intentions, I was thinking about the consequences of explaining to mother why I was in such a mess, and was simply, and naively, so grateful that the two girls were kind enough to help me out. Oh how wrong it would turn out I was, if only I had known what they were planning, it would have made the three girls who got me into this mess look like angels. By this time we were almost at Melanie's, and she told Sarah and I to go round the back of the house where she would let us in through the back door, as there was no way I could walk through the house and across the carpets in the state I was. Melanie's house was at the end of the street, the small front, side and back garden were one expanse of lawn with a gravel path round to the back door. Their plot was separated from the pavement by a four-foot hedge, tall enough to stop people taking shortcuts across their grass, but not tall enough to stop anyone looking over the top of it if they wished to. The garden was functional, they were clearly not keen gardeners, with simple flower beds round the edges, definitely low maintenance. There was a bus stop out on the pavement, this was a popular stop for those returning from work or shopping in town, but I was relieved that no one was standing there waiting for the next bus. At the side of the house they had a garden table and three chairs which we walked past and waited at the back door. Melanie appeared almost immediately and opened the back door, Sarah walked straight in, but as I stepped up to follow her, Melanie stopped me and insisted that I had to take off all my wet and muddy gear while standing on the doormat as she did not want me dirtying their floor. Yo, a naked boy, gross, cried Sarah, I need to pee and I'm not coming out till he's decent she said to Melanie and hurried off through the kitchen to the downstairs toilet. I took off my shoes, socks, shirt and tie, and began hesitantly lowering my trousers. I was getting embarrassed, but accepted that her request was not unreasonable and that I had little choice. Fortunately Melanie picked up on this, and offered to go through to the lounge whilst I took off my trousers and pants and went upstairs to shower off the mud that was now dried up in my hair. Their house was the same layout as ours, so I had no difficulty in finding my way upstairs to their bathroom. I had a lovely, hot, relaxing showing. I even used some of their shower products, body foam, shampoo, might as well make use of it as it was there. Realizing that I'd probably been in there a bit too long, but thinking it would at least have given the girls time to have my stuff ready, I got out of the shower, dried myself off, and looked round expecting to see a neat pile of clean, dry clothes. To my horror, there was nothing, so I cautiously opened the bathroom door and called down saying that I was ready to get dressed if they could bring my clothes up. It was Melanie who called back up saying we've put them out in the sun to finish off as they were not quite dry but if you just wrap a towel round you and come down, they should be dry very soon. I felt a bit awkward, but had no reason to be concerned, so I wrapped the towel I'd used round me to cover up and went downstairs. 
The girls were both in the kitchen, I'm sorry it's taking so long, but your stuff was so muddy it took longer than we thought. I put everything on the table outside to dry off in the sun, they should be ready now. I went to the back door to see if I could see my clothes, but the table was out of sight round the side of the house, Melanie disappeared off down the hall to answer the phone, and Sarah ushered me towards the back door. Holding it open she dared me to go outside with just a towel round me. I hesitated and thought about it, but she teased me by saying ow, is little Jimmy a chicken too? This was all the incentive I needed, and giving her the best you bitch face I could manage, I turned and stormed out through the back door, I'll show her a no chicken, I thought to myself. However, just as I had got past her, and was on the doorstep, she grabbed the top of the towel, whisked it off me before I could do anything to stop her, and as I was spun me round she pushed me out of the door, into the garden, absolutely naked. In a state of total shock and surprise, I heard the door being slammed the shut and locked, and saw her laughing at me through the window. Absolutely horrified, I covered my front and back as best as I could with both my hands, looked round and was thankful no one was about. Keeping as low as I could hoping no one could see me I went round to the side to recover by clothes. Even more horrified, if that was possible, laid out on the table was nothing other than a pile of very young girls' clothes that looked as if they could have been Melanie's younger sisters. I sneaked back to the back door where Melanie and Sarah were both in fits of laughter at my predicament. Where's my stuff I pleaded, almost in a whisper because I didn't want to attract attention, there's only girls' stuff, looks like Lucy's. Where's mine? It was Sarah who replied as Melanie was laughing too much, you've obviously never used a washing machine, did you really think it would only take 15 minutes to wash and dry clothes in the state yours were? It will be another, oh, 45 minutes before they're washed and at least half an hour to dry. My heart sank, what was I to do? I quickly looked round for somewhere to hide, but there was nowhere, not even a thick enough shrub to use as cover. I pleaded with the girls, okay girls, you've had your fun, please let me in, someone's going to come by soon. No way Melanie replied, this is the best fun I've had for years. I'd suggest you go and put on everything on that table, and in double quick time, cause the next bus will be here in a few minutes, and you don't want everyone seeing you like that, they'll get a good view over the hedge. And, don't forget, it's always full what with everyone coming home from work in town at this time of day. Oh my goodness, she was absolutely right, I was sunk, what could I do, nowhere to go, nowhere to hide, I had no choice. Oh, this is turning into an absolute nightmare. I tried pleading again, but to no avail, seven minutes to go reminded Sarah. If I put them on promise me you'll let me and I pleaded. We promise, but we'll check you're wearing everything, otherwise you'll be out of that door quicker than you came in replied Melanie. Quickly, and with total resignation and dejection, I tiptoed to the table to do what had to be done, and to the safety of being out of sight, trying to be as quiet as I could and because the gravel path was very uncomfortable. The table was covered with a pile of fluffy, frilly, yellow and white stuff. On the top was a pair of shiny, satin panties in a primrose yellow color. Holding them up to see if it mattered which way round they went, the bands of lace across the back gave me the answer. Slipping them on, I looked round to see if anyone was watching, fortunately the street was deserted. As I pulled them up I had so many strange feelings, this was so embarrassing, I felt stupid, annoyed and in somewhat of a panic, yet they felt so soft and comfortable, and there was something nice about wearing them I could not explain, was it just that I was relieved I was no longer naked, or was there something else? My feet were beginning to hurt being barefoot on the gravel path, so shoes seemed a good idea next. There was a pair of black patent girly shoes, but socks had been tucked into each one. I sat on one of the chairs, brushed the loose dirt off the bottom of my feet, and put on the short ankle socks which had lashings of frilly lace, yellow ribbon and bows, the lace must have been a couple of inches long. 
Next the shoes, they were the Mary Jane style with a strap that went over my foot, but I struggled to do up the buckles as I could hardly see them under all the frilly lace of the socks, but I managed and stood up, that's more comfortable I thought, even if they were a bit tight. I then heard in the distance the rattling of the bus, oh no, it would be here soon, how much time did I have, get a shift on I told myself. The next item was the hugest, fluffiest petticoat I'd ever seen. Picking it up I couldn't find my may into the bottom of it. I noticed it had a vest top to it, so put my hand in the neck part at the top and pushed it down until I was able to open up the bottom to enable me to slip it over my head. This was not that easy though, you could drown in all those frills and layers, but eventually I slid it down and over my hips. As I was looking up to put my arms into the right holes, I noticed Sarah and Melanie leaning out of the upstairs bathroom window, they were in fits watching me getting dressed, but I had no time as I could hear the bus getting closer. I grabbed the dress, slung it over my head, pushed my arms through the sleeves, and pulled it down over the petticoat. It had buttons up the back but I could only reach one at the bottom, and one at the top at the neck, I looked up and shouted, as loudly as I dared, to them to get down to the back door. I raced round to the door, desperately, but unsuccessfully trying to fiddle with the rest of the buttons, but managed to do up those on the sleeves just above my elbow. The girls were laughing at me through the glass panel of the door. I could hear the bus slowing down to a stop behind me, but I didn't dare turn round, please, please let me in I begged, almost in tears, only if you let us play with you some more and make you look even prettier than you are Sarah said. I was not listening to what they said I was in such a panic, yes, yes, anything, just let me in please. To my relief they unlocked the door, and I almost fell and I was in such a hurry. I ran across the kitchen out of sight of the back door, dress and petticoats billowing everywhere. Melanie and Sarah caught up with me in the hall, they were both in tears they had been laughing so much. Give us a twirl they both said at the same time and laughed even more. I turned round slowly, and when they saw all the buttons were undone they threatened to throw me out into the garden, but I can't reach them I pleaded. Sarah smiled, well, that's a shame, she said whilst doing up the buttons I'd missed, that means that if I do them up, you won't be able to undo them unless you ask us nicely. I realized that I was now totally stuck and completely at their mercy, I had no choice but to play along with whatever they had in mind for me. I also realized that after all that had I happed I really need to pee, very badly, please may I use your bathroom I asked Melanie as politely as I could. Certainly not, she replied little girls of your age don't use the bathroom, they still use nappies. Sarah, could you get the nappy changing stuff from the spare room? There's still some of Lucy's old stuff in there we were about to get rid of, but we might as well make use of rather than throw it out. As Sarah rushed upstairs, with my last ounce of defiance I made a dash for the toilet. Melanie caught me, grabbed my arm, and twisting it behind my back, marched me towards the front door. We said we'd throw you outside if you didn't do as we said, and you promised, remember. Now, do you want to go out there? She threatened me, with one hand on the front door handle. Please no, I begged, but I do need to pee. Sarah had returned with an armful of things, everything here we need, I think she said triumphantly. Melanie, still twisting my arm, brought me to the ground on the carpet. Sarah had put her arms under my petticoat and dress, my petticoat and dress, what was happening to me, and pushed them up above waist exposing my panties. With Sarah holding me down by my chest, and with all the froth and layers making it almost impossible for me to free my arms and resist, Melanie quickly and expertly pulled my panties down, lifted my bottom off the floor, rubbed some cream into my groin, slid a thick disposable nappy under me, securely taped it on. She also slid a pair of plastic pants under my bottom which she pulled up between my legs and closed using poppers up each side and round my thighs, finally pulling my frilly panties back up over everything. There, all sorted said Melanie, helping me up and patting me on my padded bottom. 
Unable to hold on any longer, I let loose a steady stream of pee into my nappy. It was as if this was me consciously demonstrating my submission and acceptance of my fate. Melanie obviously felt the warmth through my panties, she kissed me on the forehead and told me what a good little girl I was. Not to be left out Sarah took me by the hand, led me upstairs, and into Melanie's bedroom. By this time I was beyond broken, thoroughly resigned to whatever games they wanted to play with me, and wishing my nightmare would be over as soon as possible. They, however, still had more humiliation for me. Melanie pulled the stool in front of her dressing table mirror over beside the bed and told me to sit on it, instructing me to make sure I got all my petticoat and pretty dress out of the way first. I dutifully complied and sat down facing the bed. I even placed one upturned hand into the other and rested them on my lap on top of my petticoats, a definite sissy pose which did not go unnoticed, how sweet they both said at the same time. Sarah grabbed a load of stuff off the dressing table, sat down on the bed facing me, and proceeded to rub various creams and lotions into my face, wiping some off with little round soft cloths, and then covered my whole face and neck with flesh-colored concealers, foundation, and fixer. Yellow and green eyeshadow, followed by mascara and false eyelashes sorted my eyes, she trimmed a few long eyebrows so they were neater and less boyish, and showed me how to pout my lips so she could apply a cherry pink lipstick, edging it with something like a small paintbrush, and finally applying a glossy top coat to make them look all shiny. Whilst Sarah was concentrating on my face, Melanie had painted my fingernails a matching pink and told me to keep my hands to the side and shake them a bit to dry them quickly. Sarah leant back a couple of times to admire her work, made a few final touches, and as soon as she announced she was finished, Melanie came up behind me and pulled on my head a blonde wig, with curly ringlets all round, Lucy wore this with one of her dance costumes, I thought it would totally complete your new look. Oh, perfect, said Sarah. Now, let's get you in front of that mirror so you can see the new you. With both her hands on my shoulders, Melanie guided me over to the mirrored doors on the front of her wardrobe. The image was spectacular, even breathtaking, if it wasn't for the fact that it was me. I had been transformed, I was now a ten-year-old girl, with long blonde hair with lots of cute ringlets. My face was absolutely immaculate, almost doll-like and too perfect, unblemished skin, eyes so innocent they could melt butter, and lashes so long and thick I could not help but keep fluttering them. My pink lips were pink and glossy, they looked wet and the smell and taste of the makeup and lipstick was somehow intoxicating and made me feel quite heady and dizzy. My primrose yellow satin dress had a white satin peterpin collar, a tight fighting bodice, sleeves that come down to my elbows, which buttoned up beneath two rows of white lace that tickled my arms. The yellow satin sleeves were covered with puffs of organza which had little dots and hearts in them, and went all the way down to the lace frills, making big girly puff shoulders. The organza covering continued over the bodice down to the waistline. As I stood there, pretty much in a state of shock, Sarah had tied a wide, white satin sash around my waist and into a huge bow at the back, with a tight knot to make sure I could not undo it without assistance. From the waist the dress flared out, almost horizontally due to the fullness of the petticoat that constantly tickled my legs. My arms were extended at the size and my delicate fingers ended with bright pink nail polish. On my feet were white ankle socks, with wide white lace and yellow ribbon and bows, and black patent Mary Jane shoes. Underneath my petticoat, but thankfully not visible to me at least, I was wearing a disposable nappy, which I had used, plastic pants which made a crinkling noise as I walked, and yellow satin panties, elasticated at the waist and legs for a tight fit, and with rows and rows of white lace. As I stood there admiring the image of the prettiest little girl I had ever since, my emotions were at overload. I was totally embarrassed and humiliated, annoyed with girls in general as clearly they were all wicked and bad, with Melanie and Sarah in particular at how they had tricked me, couldn't believe I was wearing a nappy which I was using, wondering how I was going to get out of this bizarre situation, worried about what my mother or father would say if they ever found out.
whether the girls would let me go before mother got home and would worry I was not there, and yet, at the same time something, was making me compliant in going along with their little game. I was actually getting a thrill from wearing these girly clothes, I was so relaxed and at ease, it was like escaping into a dream, I liked how pretty they had made me look, how they had transformed me so cleverly from a boy to a girl that even I would not have recognized me as James, it was strangely comforting using a nappy, so much so that I realized that I was peeing myself again without thinking about it. I was so confused, so many things were wrong, but at the same time so many seemed right, what sort of person was I, was I so short because I wasn't supposed to be a boy? All these thoughts and emotions were rushing through my head when Melanie suddenly gasped and told Sarah that she had to get to the shop quickly before it closed as there were some essentials she had to get. That's no problem, we'll all go, said Sarah. Before I realized what was happening I had been marched downstairs, and unable to think clearly with everything spinning round and round in my head, we were out of the front door and on the street. Melanie had grabbed my hand and was making a big thing about telling to be a good girl and to keep hold of her hand otherwise she would put me back in reins next time. In no time at all we were at the corner shop, Melanie gave my hand to Sarah to look after me and dashed off getting the things she needed. Sarah took me to the children's magazines and comics section and kept picking up asking me if I wanted this one. I was praying that no one would come in, but fortunately no one else left it this late to do their shopping. I kept saying no thank you in my sweetest girly voice, and eventually she got the message but asked if I wanted a lollipop for being such a good girl. To keep her quiet I said yes please and we met Melanie at the till we she paid for everything. As we left the shop, Melanie unwrapped the lollipop and handed it me. My head had stopped spinning and I was able to think more clearly. I had lost all track of time, but reckoned it had to be about 6.30 if the shop was about to close. In my first, albeit rather pathetic and feeble, act of trying to regain some control over the whole situation, and with some trepidation as to the consequences, I told the girls that I had to be home by 7.00 otherwise my mother would worry where I was. Before they could answer, and to my horror, around the corner came Mrs. Buchanan, one of mother's good friends. I was frozen to the spot, what if she recognized me? I quickly shoved the lollipop in my mouth and stared at the ground not daring to make any eye contact with anyone. I would have bent my head down further and stared at my feet if I could, but my petticoat stuck out so much I could not see them. Mrs. Buchanan spoke with Melanie and Sarah, asked what they had been doing as it had been some time since she had spoken with them, and asked after their parents. After a pleasant conversation I could feel her gaze directed towards me, and she asked the girls, and who do we have here, I've not seen you before, and as she bent down to try and make eye contact I tried to turn away from her and sucked my lollipop as hard as I could, trying to act like I seemed to remember little girls might. Oh she is a shy one, but stunningly pretty. I dreaded the girl's reply, what if they said this is James Little? don't you recognize him, or something similar. I was in such a state of panic I felt myself pee my nappy again, could this get any worse? Thankfully Sarah replied that they were babysitting me, and that Melanie had to collect something from home before getting me back to my parents. She also added, in a whisper, that they needed to dash off now as it had been some time since their little girl had been changed, and she would probably be wet by now. How right they were. They all laughed, but Mrs. Buchanan stared at me and said to the girls you know, if that Mrs. Little had had a daughter, I swear this little one could have been James' sister, there's quite a resemblance. You know, between the two of us, it was such a shame she always wanted a girl, but couldn't have any more after James. With a wistful look she scurried off in one direction whilst we hurried off in the other. I was so relieved I wet myself again, but again with mixed emotions. On the one hand I was so thankful I had not been recognized, and yet I got quite a thrill from fooling everyone. I loved the way the warm summer breeze wafted over the tops of my legs, it was all so dangerously exciting. 
We were soon back at Melanie's, they took me upstairs, helped me out of all my clothes including the nappy which by now was very wet and heavy. Do you think you can be trusted or would you like a clean one said Sarah sarcastically. No thank you I replied, but inwardly half of me wishing I could say yes. I was taken into the bathroom where they cleaned off all traces of eyelashes, makeup and lipstick, and got a bottle of remover to take of my nail varnish. I was marched, naked, into the bedroom, where we were met by Melanie who had come up with all my boys' clothes which were now dry. Before I was allowed to put them on, Melanie grabbed both my shoulders, looked me straight in the eyes and said now tell me that you didn't enjoy that, tell me you wouldn't want to do something like that again soon. I would have loved to have been able to look her back straight in the eye and told her that they were the cruelest girls I had ever met, I hated every minute of it, I have never, nor ever want to dress up as girl, and that I was going to tell someone what they had done to me, but I couldn't, I stared back at her, I wanted to say can we do it again, my lips moved but the words wouldn't come out. I just mumbled something unintelligible, got dressed as quickly as I could, began to make a dash for the door, but as I reached it, something made me stop, turn round and say to them both thank you. They both cheered and punched the air, yeah, another convert said Sarah, and they high-fived each other. See you again, eh? I couldn't say no, I just left and walked home. Arriving a few minutes later and walking up the path I suddenly realized how different the past few hours had been from what I had envisaged. It had been the most amazing experience, scary, humiliating, embarrassing and yet incredibly exciting, edgy and fun. I remembered I didn't have my key, but mum's car wasn't there, I noticed the kitchen window had been left slightly open, one of the few advantages of being small was that I could squeeze through small gaps like that. But had I now found a new advantage of being small? I pushed the window open a little further as far as it would go and managed to get inside. I closed the window to where it had been, collected my key, and unlocked the front door, closing it as if I had come in that way. I turned on the TV and was watching a film when Mum came in. Hi Mum, everything okay with Grant? I inquired. She came over, gave me a big hug and a kiss on the forehead, and said yes, thank you dear, you're such a thoughtful boy, did you have a nice evening? Not got up to any trouble I hope. The kiss on the forehead reminded me of the one Melanie had given me after I had first wet my nappy, could I tell her what I had got up to for the past few hours? I wanted to but didn't dare, nor know where to start, so I just said nothing exciting, a bit of homework, a little time on the computer and some TV. Not really much happened at all. I spent most of the evening deep in thought, reliving my adventure and wondering where things would go from here. It's not easy being a teenager, I've heard people say that hormones do funny things with the mind, that adolescence is a difficult time, perhaps this is what they mean.